Good afternoon and welcome back, uh, everyone. Um, a quick programme update before we start with this session. Uh, for those of you who are attending uh, Fringe Meeting 5 at 4.50 this afternoon, that's the Mercer session. It's not in Charter 5 as billed on our programme. Charter 5 doesn't actually exist. It's in Charter 4. Uh, it's clearly signposted as you go through and staff will be on hand to help you find it if there's any trouble. Um, but now on to our next session on the Conference Challenge. Uh, and those of, us, those of you who were with us last year in Liverpool will, uh, I hope, remember the Conference Challenge we ran over the three days of the event. Three days, ten young people, two expert coaches. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined by Steve and Greg again. Uh, but before we talk about our reflections on it, let's remind ourselves of what we did with the teams last year. Food in general. I love food, restaurants, and taking the wife out, I think, quite at, at different places. Well, I don't drive, so it's not a car. It's like a holiday, can I say that? A holiday. That's all my money goes on holidays. Like I, when I save, it's for a holiday. That's a tough mm. one, because I've just had my braces done. It is, because I've got a few, I've had a few things. There's a few things I've had. I've bought a coat. It was about 250 quid. Still hurts me, but I've got it. I love it. Still in my closet. <laughs> Boob job. Or oh, about eye laser surgery. Pair of the songs. I could get one all day. Though. So the most expensive item I've ever bought is a Louboutin handbag, nine inch pound. It's going to be a large amount to fund the lifestyle that I want. I think I need roughly between 70 80,000 to be comfortable on like a 10 to 15,000 uh, per annum salary. I've worked it out about 40 grand a year at need for 30 years of my retirement, so it's 1.2 million I'll need in my pot. 600k will give you about 18,000 a year, that's going up in line with inflation. So 300,000 give you about 9,000 pounds a year. A 300k, 9k, you're, pro you're possibly just living within your means. I really need to think about having my own little pot as well as that, because you know who knows if there's even gonna be a state pension by the time I retire. It's pretty scary. So I've just got a few questions for you. First one being, what exactly do you do with the money when I put it in? Well, we invest your money for you, Derek. So we'll put it in some funds that invest in stocks and shares, all different types of investment to give you a broadly diversified returns. By maybe changing the terminology and making it into perhaps um, lifetime savings makes it more reachable for everyone at every age. Um, you know, if you think like in Australia, they call it my super. And that's very positive. If we could rebrand the future savings, that's, that's the way forward. I think it's really important to have pensions or lifetime savings fund compulsory as soon as we start work. Because every month from our salary we have national insurance deducted, tax deducted. So if we have compulsory pension or lifetime savings fund taken out every month, and when we do finally retire, everyone will be happy and think, I'm so glad that it was compulsory. Tap and go. So it's a simple app service where you have all your pension pots in a dashboard and it's going to be very easy for functionality to move one pot to the other. Everyone has a smartphone, everyone uses all the social media aspects. My vision is to get everyone on a tap and go system so it's a lot more accessible and easier. It's just really simple. So our first, first various points makes pensions, so all the loyalty cards that you currently have, your Tesco club card, your Nexa card, instead of generating vouchers or days out, you can use it and you scan all your cards into the app, you, ge you generate maybe £10 per card 
as an incentive to start. And then once you build up your points, you can then put that into your pension instead of getting these vouchers or days out, look at the long term. Our second idea was plain English education. We believe you need to be educated and taught basically what is a pension, how does it work, how much do you need to invest for the future to have a good quality of life, basic understanding. So we feel confident to invest in our future and how much we need to invest and at what age. We had the option of, like now, an auto-enrolment into a pension, but just as you can auto-enroll now, you can opt out straight away. Um, and I think it's a case of changing people's mind frames and the way that they think. So if we had an opt-out option after six months, that will then encourage people to stay in it a lot longer and, and kind of get used to the money coming out of their account and thinking nothing about it. We thought that maybe after the six month period as well, just to keep people going even longer, perhaps a bonus from the government. But it's just about changing the mind frame of people and the way that they're thinking and looking at pensions in a positive light rather than thinking of it as tax because, you know, it's not tax, it is helping you in the future. So they were two great teams, weren't they? And I wonder, as coaches, what you took away from the experience of working with them last year, Steve? I think what struck me was that they were hooked within a few hours. So even on the first night, by the end of it, they were saying, why has nobody ever told us this? And although you've got kind of real people there, and, and I must confess, Greg or I have never spent 900 quid on a Louis Vuitton bag. Um, Speak you know, yourself. <laughs> I know you're a, you're a new man, Greg. Um, but it, it, it wasn't that they weren't interested, it's just nobody had ever told them, and nobody had ever told them in a way that grabbed them. And I think that was quite encouraging. The other thing that struck me is I could tell my team were made of good stuff is that since then, and we'll find out a bit more, they've kept in touch, you know, they've been had on a WhatsApp group, whatever that is, um, and that, you know, whenever there's a pension story, they share it with each other. So it wasn't just they had an amazing time in Liverpool and then went away and forgot about it, it really landed with them. And you, Greg? Yeah, I think the, the extraordinary energy and enthusiasm and intellect that the, the teams brought to the task uh, was, was invigorating, I think we both felt. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes for those of us in the industry, you can see the problem, but you can't see any solutions. And that, that energy and enthusiasm was really striking. Related to that, nothing in, in their history as millennials about not trusting pensions. They had issues with pensions as a, as a concept because they felt it was about being old, but not about being ripped off or any of that kind of thing. Just not part of the, the history they have. And finally, just in time, education. We talk a lot about just in time. Captured right away, Steve said, you get in the room, you start doing the numbers about how much you need in retirement, and there's, a, there's an engagement right away, which I think speaks to that. You have to pick your moments to, to try and educate and engage. Mm. I remember we were really worried about that Friday morning session, whether they'd be articulate enough to um, get across their ideas. And, and in fact, it was you two who couldn't get a word in, really, because <laughs> they were so, so confident in forming and expressing their ideas. And, and those six ideas are things which have informed our work throughout the year and have informed uh, the makeup of the programme here this week, I think. So there were a couple of ideas there on the technology side, this tap and go concept, uh, points make pensions. Things like that are driving our engagement with the pensions dashboard project, for example. We, we think that's got the potential to make some of those ideas a reality. Uh, we've got a session here on Friday morning on the next generation of fintech and what that can do for uh, engagement. A um, couple of ideas they had about making automatic enrolment uh, bigger and broader, if I can put it that way. Uh, and that's been influential in shaping our views on uh, the age threshold, for example. We're, we're calling for 18-year-olds to be included. Why start at 22? Uh, we're, ask, we're calling for contributions to go up gradually to 12% again reflecting the views we saw in that video uh, and, the, and the, the, uh, the plain English ideas and the dropping the word pensions we'll come back to uh, in a bit of video later in this session but before we do that let's find out what uh, the teams have been up to in the last year uh, I met most of them here in this very building actually a couple of weeks ago So guys, what, what do you remember from your time with us last year, the three days you spent with us up in Liverpool? It was a real eye-opener last year, really. I didn't really think too much on pensions because I thought I was young, what time and 
I don't know, I thought everything would just fall into place. I knew I had to do something. Over a year ago, like obviously I can't focus a lot on my uh, state pension. That's one of the awareness things I've got from the whole event. But we did some exercise where we're looking at the vision boards and where you want to see yourself and stuff. And I'm thinking where I am at the moment, I'm not in a position to, to have that lifestyle. So, you know, I need to be taking action and steps to move towards it. So we, we had our two teams last year, uh, Team Steve, Team Greg. And I've heard from talking to Steve and Greg that there's been some uh, contact since there's been some uh, emails or whatsapp group set up who, who was doing that yeah so we were team steve um, along with a few others and we've still got the whatsapp group and um, we post pensions and uh, news stories things like that or just catching up really don't we from from the group discussions it's always bad news <laughs> I, I think one one of the main ones was uh, the pension age it's not necessarily bad news but everybody feels like it's always a surprise when you put something there that did anyone know this? We spoke to Steve a few times via email, he just catched up to see how we are. Um, yeah, it's good, we've all kept in contact. And since you spent that time in this last year, do you kind of see pensions in a different way? Do you notice it more in the press? Do you talk to colleagues or family about it? And what sort of things have you noticed? Yeah, when I came back from the conference last year, a lot of people in work and my friends asked um, what it was about and when I explained, they definitely went away and had a look at their pension in more detail. Whether they did increase their contributions, I'm not too sure, but um, I, I definitely think it raised thoughts about doing it. And since last year, I've actually increased the percentage I'm doing on my, on, on my, on my pension that I'm putting away. but. Um, Realistically speaking, it's not enough. I know it's not enough. Uh, last year actually pushed me to have a, a, a conscious chat with my wife, with my missus about our pension, about our family, about uh, our future and our kids' future. Quite encouraging that I, I know where I'm going and what I want, where I want to go. I did take the opportunity to discuss it with family members, especially my parents. Um, I don't think it's something, even in their age, they've looked too much into which is a bit scary but I did express the importance that they need to look into it, need to know where their pots are and need to know kind of what percentages they're putting in. So when I got out and um, everyone was asking where I'd been and everyone was really shocked that like they didn't know about their pensions either so I actually um, contacted HR and asked them to come up to Manchester to just um, brief everyone really about their pensions. We have other um, schemes at work as well so that they were covered as well but yeah, it was really interesting. So I think it's I think it's fair to say, isn't it, that, that some of the changes we saw there are, are rather more impressive than we expect, uh, expected when we set out on this journey, Greg? Yeah, I uh, think so. I mean, the, the, the evidence of, of change behaviour seems pretty strong. And I guess the challenge is scalability, isn't it? It's yeah. one thing to get 10... Um, remarkable young people uh, in a room for three days intensively discuss pensions. Um, how do we scale that, I think, is the, is the big question. Mm. And I think the fact that by the first evening they were hooked is encouraging. You know, they were already in... Even the kind of how long might I live for and then what does that mean for a size of a pension pot? Just those two basic things. And I thought the fact that Lauren, you know, from my team, goes back to the office and everyone says, you did what? He spent three days talking to people about pensions and she realises none of them know anything about it, so she gets HR in to do a seminar. You know, it just shows the untapped potential, I think. Mm. Yeah, it's, re it's really impressive. And, 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 it, and it is that point about what, what are the clues we can take from that? Because much as I'd love to, we can't get everybody in for three days at our conference. So what, what are the sort of hints we can take away? The, the clearest thing was that both Greg and I, we, we basically had a Chinese wall over the period and, and there was a bit of looking around seeing what the other team were doing, a bit like on Bake Off. Um, and um, both of us came up independently with essentially smartphone type approaches. You know, it was obvious to these groups that they live their life on their smartphone, that if they were going to be communicated with, if they're going to feel in control, informed, all that stuff, it was going to be in their hand. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's, you know, you can press a button and merge your pensions or put your nectar points on your pension, it's got to be, you know, this is where they expect to be. And, you know, we can do the best leaflets we like, but actually if it's not technologically accessible, it's not going to work. And I think I would just add to that, in addition, the also a sense, at least from one team and maybe from the other two, that pensions might be something that you have to make me do. That came across in the compulsory mm. savings idea. Um, 
the sense was that, as you saw from the, the clips there, that look, we, were, were, we pay tax for other things, we pay national insurance. If you're telling us, as inverted commas experts, this is so important, <laughs> then why aren't you making us do it? Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's a, that's a question perhaps for the next panel. We'll hold that thought for our <laughs> AE reviewers. <laughs> um, I don't think that's in their terms of reference. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. Um, so I, I want to turn now to, to language, which was one of the things we heard quite a lot from uh, the teams. Um, the need to use plain language, to use it at the right time, and specifically to, to drop the word pension, which was something they were very keen on. Um, we've been working with people from around the industry over the last few months, uh, Quiet Room, Eversheds and, and Ruston Smith down there, um, to see how we might take that forward. Uh, and we've been using uh, annual statements as an example, because it's something that we all produce and, and everybody gets at the moment. Um, so when I met the teams last month, uh, I asked them for what they thought of this um, draft model statement, uh, which we've been working on. Uh, Key things here really are there's, there's two pages uh, and within those two pages there are three signposted and colour-coded elements. Uh, how much have I got now? How much might that produce in the future? And how can I affect change? Uh, we've mocked it up here as uh, an annual statement, as you can see, but the, 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 the information presented in modules was, could just as easily be uh, presented on a dashboard, on smartphones, to your point, Steve, about the way people... Which, the way in which people consume information. Um, but um, we wanted to test uh, our participants' attitudes to, to this level of information. Uh, but in order to do that, we started by showing them a sample of the existing statements. I, I gave them some of mine to look at. Okay, so you've had a few minutes now uh, going through my finances and, and look at some of my pension statements. What, what's your overall impression of those communications? From what I'm looking at, I think you need to say more, Graham. <laughs> the layout of it, the way things are presented could be a lot clearer and go straight to the point sometimes. The value of your plan, so the breakdown of that, like the units you have, the price of the unit and then the fund value, it's just not 100% clear because those figures are absolutely massive and then it turns out to tell you how much you, you will actually come out with at the end of it. It's just not clear of how it all breaks down really. And one particular bit, I don't know if it's just me personally, but it was deferred money purchase benefit. I think what was confusing for me is you got like different type of funds, uh, that was a bit unclear for me as well. <coughs> Simple, but enough detail. I like that everything is on one single page, so there's not several pages to look through, and everything is sort of summarised on one single page. This is much better than what I've seen previously. When, when we came in to Liverpool, you did mention, like, so I have a coffee every morning at the coffee shop. You mentioned if you say, if you didn't have that coffee in the morning, you put that into your pension. So maybe you could put an example in there like that, just to relate it to everyday life. Something so simple could lead to something greater in the future. If there is a specific figure, let's call it a green line, whereby if you get that figure, you've got to have a healthy pension, not necessarily anything fancy. So let's say if it's 150,000, and um, if we have something that indicates how far you are from that 150,000, so that would be up to the government, up to their, to, to their organization to know that this is what roughly someone might need to survive. And, then I've got something like, it might be a graph or just a line or whatever, and it tells me you're, to, to survive um, comfortably in your pension, you are 110,000 pounds off. And to get to that, you might need to increase your pension to X, Y, Z. Yeah, I, I do agree. That you would like to know the charges, things like that, but not everyone wants to know that. So maybe put in a, high, a link there to the website to explain the charges. It tells me exactly what my employer puts in, considering the fact that, I mean, a few of us have changed jobs then um, um, I still know what the letters mean. It's not changing because I've changed companies. It got rid of all the pension jargon that we, we spoke about and the term pension wasn't used as much, which was great, well, actually, at all. It was really good. Hi there, Joe. 
Darren here with a brief update on your annual statement. So it's been a fantastic year for you and your account, and here is a brief summary. You started off the year with £44,812.63 in the pot. Through our trusted advisors, you'll be pleased to know we have grown your account by £9,072.27 bringing your account to a grand value of £53,767.99p. Our team is working tirelessly to ensure this continues to grow, by which you, by your 67th birthday, we expect your pension pot to be £98,200. That is your pension pot. But a few quick facts for you. Based on our projections, you're looking at 268 per calendar month, guaranteed for the rest of your life. If you have any further questions, please feel free to call me personally on the number below. Have a good day. <laughs> I, I just love the pos positivity that Darren and Mike brought to that exercise. Uh, they, they had about 30 minutes to get ready for that. I think they did a great job. Uh, yet again. Um, but, you know, obviously we used an annual statement as our example there, but I, I, I guess that some of the lessons that we, we, we learned from them there could be applicable to other forms of communication. It doesn't have to be a piece of paper going through the door every year. Steve? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I saw the representative of the FCA pass out during that video. <laughs> and I, I guess there is a balance, isn't there, if we're so tight and prescriptive about how we regulate communications, the danger is we then have 30 pages of caveats and then if you don't, you know, that's the balance. Mm. So I think, re I hope regulators are in the room when these conversations are being had and, and proportionate and light touch regulation of some of this would, would go a long way. But as you say, you know, Making the written communications is a start, but it, the risk is it's a sort of analogue solution in the digital world kind of thing, and that actually this has to translate to the online stuff. I think what we need is push notifications, so you know, your phone's there, you get something pops up, oh, you need to respond to it, it's from your pension account telling you something's happened, prompting you to do something. I, I do think that if auto enrolment tells us anything, it's that the system needs to take the initiative and nudge you. We still can't just wait for people to be well-informed, educated and engaged and for them to come to us. Mm -hmm. Rick. I, mean, I think yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a great development if it can be nailed down, the, the simplified statement. As, as Steve suggests, the, the, the more digital approach, of course, in Australia, that's a matter, of course, with super. We're going to hear more about that during the, the rest of this conference. One observation I would make is, and I think this becomes an issue down the line, uh, engagement isn't necessarily a good in itself. It's the, it's the behaviours that it drives. And I would like to see some research done at some stage about what happens in, in market downturns. If, if we get to a stage where information is simplified yes. and the information is very easily available and someone sees their pot drop 10%, you know, prospect theory tells us pretty clearly behavioural science that mm. you know, people, that's what people worry about is a, is a change in their, their absolute position rather than relatively speaking. Yeah. And I, I yeah. think that, that's something we will need to do more research on. Yeah, I did, I did wonder how Darren might adapt his uh, positive <laughs> approach for, for those more yeah. difficult We had years. a bad year, but here's some good reasons. Kind of thing, yeah. <laughs> and I've still got a cup of tea in my hand. Um, a, a, another thing we saw in that clip was uh, Derek talking about uh, how having a sense of what a reasonable retirement income uh, uh, might be would help, uh, something that we raised in our Hitting the Target report last week. I, I wonder if you've got thoughts on, on this kind of concept of giving people some fairly simple and realistic targets that they might use to, to, to gauge how much might be enough. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think the challenge is, if you say in your video, looks to us like you need 5% a year or you know, whatever to reach your target, so you know, if you put 100 quid a month extra in, we reckon you'll reach the target, and you come back two years later and they say, we did what you told us, and actually we're now further away from the target than, you know, the, the world we're in, the litigious world, the sort of retrospective legislation that we sometimes get, we've really got to communicate to people it's our best efforts, it's not guaranteed, and all that kind of stuff, without bucket loads of caveats and mistrust, and that's a really challenging balance, I think. Yeah. Greg, what do you think? Clearly, and this space is evolving, isn't it? The, the Turner Commission had a very clear view about two-thirds um, of your final salary as a, as a pension income. There's a lot of evidence now that you don't need as much as that, generally speaking. Um, so it's evolving. 
I would say that rules of thumb are very useful. As Steve says, it's got to be clear about that it's a rule of thumb rather than a, mm -hmm. you know, a cast iron um, promise or advice. But rules of thumb have to help. Otherwise, people are kind of they're stumbling about in the fog if they don't have a sense of where broadly they need to get to. And the good news is it's less rather than more. Often the retirement smile effect is quite well established now. That generally speaking, people spend less in retirement than they expect to. So there, there's some good news in there if we can get those rules of thumb right. Although I think when I was in the DWP, we'd look quite hard at coming up with a, a rule of thumb that had a number in it. And we found anything like that incredibly difficult. But I think something that said, start as soon as you can, up your contributions when you get a pay rise, max out on what your employer will give you. Frankly, if you do those three, you're well away. Mm. It's a great starting point. I, I agree. Um, that, unfortunately, is pretty much all we've got time for in this session. Uh, thank you both for your continuing support for this project. Um, should we do something again next year? <laughs> See if we can catch up with them again. Um, but for now, please join me in thanking Greg and Steve. Can I just keep my microphone on? Um, there are, as I, as I mentioned, plenty of other opportunities to catch up on uh, related activities over the course of the programme. Uh, in particular, please do look out for Quiet Room in the Learning Hub tomorrow at four o'clock. Uh, they'll be seeking your feedback on the, the simpler statements that I talked briefly through there. Um, on the subject of better communications, though, I'm delighted that Greg, as uh, Chair of Pension Quality Mark, has agreed to present a PQM Distinction Award uh, recognising great communications. Over to you, Greg. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Graham. The Pension Quality Mark Distinction Award for Communication represents the gold standard in pensions communication. All the schemes who have been examined have already been assessed as high quality through the PQM accreditation process. The schemes in the shortlist are a beacon for our industry and a beacon for getting communication right that we think at PQM that other schemes can learn from in developing their own engagement and communications around pensions. We will use at PQM this information to provide further practical insights, ideas, examples going forward. Before announcing the winner, I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank the judging panel, which included my colleagues from PQM, Georgina Stewart and Nigel Stanley, as well as Jonathan Ryder from Landscape, Jonathan Stapleton from Professional Pensions, and Debbie O'Donovan from the Re Rewards and Employee Benefit Association. So to the shortlist and the winner. The shortlist was compiled across the year and includes Arkiva Group Personal Pension Plan, Church Administrators Pension Fund, Heineken Flexible Retirement Plan, National Grid U Plan, Sony UK Pension Trust Limited, and the Electricity Northwest Group. The judging panel, it's fair to say, were impressed by the quality of the communications and display across all these schemes, which demonstrated that better communications can make a difference to retirement saving outcomes. So high was the quality of the entries that the judging panel decided to award a highly recommended to National Grid's U Plan. Congratulations to National Grid, who understood, in our opinion, their workforce and their communication focused on employees increasing contributions and how to take those savings when they were older and coming towards retirement. Well done, National Grid. But the winner of the award, the inaugural PQM Distinction Award for Communications, is Heineken. The judges felt that Heineken... <laughs> Well done, Heineken. The judges felt that Heineken worked hard to communicate the importance of retiring with a decent pension and did it with flair and creativity. There were lots of good nudges to improve communication and the personality of the scheme the judges felt came through. The practical elements were well observed, such as roadshows, websites and tools. The judges particularly liked the My Retirement Guide that was short and sharp providing all the relevant information for the employee in an easy to understand language, something of course which we've just discussed. The judges feel that 
the market could learn from Heineken's approach. In conclusion, the judges felt that it would be difficult to work at Heineken and not have saved enough money for retirement. And after all, isn't that what it's all about? So to Heineken, congratulations. To my colleagues at PQM, including the executive, thank you for all your hard work this year and the inaugural awards. And we look forward to continuing to try to improve communications as we move forward. So Heineken, congratulations again on winning the inaugural title. Thank you very much. Greg, sorry, I think they're still coming up on stage just to collect the award off you, if that's OK. <laughs> I, sorry, I didn't make that clear. <laughs> Well done. Thank you, Greg, and, and my hand over there emphasised the importance of good communication.